on the right you see GraphQL logo and uh, that's what I will be talking about today and then in the middle uh, we see Relay logo it's, uh, it's a thing that connects both uh, React and GraphQL and uh, I think it deserves a separate talk so it's a call for your fellow developers to do a, a talk about Relay and uh, yeah, so let's start uh, today's talk will be only about GraphQL. Uh, GraphQL is basically your uh, server, your API. Uh, I will tell you why we use it, uh, how it helps us, and uh, I'll tell you the pain points that we built through, and uh, there will be a live coding session. <laughs> what could go wrong? And, uh, so why are we using uh, GraphQL? First of all, we're building a mobile app and uh, mobile networks tend to have bad latency. Does anyone know the response time for, uh, average response time for a 3G network? Anyone? 15 milliseconds. Sorry? 250 milliseconds. 250? Yeah. Yeah, that's about the average. It's from uh, 100 milliseconds up to half a second. So it's uh, kind of slow. The, the speed is good, but the response time is uh, not as good. So our goal is to have has the, the data fetches, and uh, the best way to do that is probably to have less network. Uh, we connect a lot of uh, in-house services. We have a lot of microservices uh, in Wix, and uh, we call them verticals, and uh, our our app is kind of horizontal, we connect uh, most of them. Uh, we have, now I think it's not 15, it's maybe 17 or 18. And uh, we want to have uh, less man maintenance help, uh, and we think that uh, GraphQL helps us with that. Uh, we need a fast evolving API because uh, we're building a uh, mobile app and we need to handle backwards compatibility. Uh, that's because once you release a mobile uh, application, it's basically out there. You, you cannot change it the way you can change web. There are ways, of course, to push your JavaScript into a native application, but uh, it's really painful and uh, you just have uh, backwards compatibility. Uh, we released our app uh, within three months, so this was done by people new uh, to React Native and new to GraphQL, so I'm not gonna lie. Uh, we have some technical debt, uh, and uh, we think that uh, GraphQL helps us uh, with that. So how does it help? Well, of course, it uh, helps us have less uh, network request by uh, requests by combining them into one uh, single request. Uh, as you can see from the picture, uh, you call, uh, you query a hero and, and, and his name and also names of all of his friends. And usually with the uh, regular REST API, uh, instead of friend, friend names, you would have some <coughs> references to, to those friends, like IDs or URLs or something like that. So uh, GraphQL does uh, the heavy lifting for you uh, on the server and gives you back the actual end. Uh, it helps us have predictable results. Think of it as uh, as code queries. Like, uh, if you select ID from a database, you will get an ID. If you select title and uh, ID, you will get title and ID. And, uh, I think uh, <coughs> GraphQL is uh, really great about that. Uh, it also has type system. Uh, the type system helps us ensure that the app uh, asks for only for what is possible and if it doesn't, uh, we, it, it provides meaningful and helpful errors. Uh, also, it's kind of a side effect, uh, but uh, when you write GraphQL, uh, you have kind of data shape. Uh, if you work with uh, a lot of different services, uh, each of them have different, different responses and you have to look over the documentation or the actual code to know what kind of res res uh, responses you get. And uh, 
when you write your types in GraphQL, you actually write those responses, so you don't really have to remember. And you don't really have to go to see the documentation over and over again. So that's the thing I really like about it. Uh, uh, since we have to choose backwards compatibility, uh, it helps us with the uh, deprecation mechanism. And uh, we have the freedom to extend existing types. So you can see in the picture, uh, for example, our initial app only wants uh, the title episode and release date of the film. And uh, if we change the film type and add more fields, the queries that were written beforehand are not actually affected because they get the same data. They only ask for title, episode, and release that, uh, date, and they only get that. Uh, the deprecation mechanism is, uh, is very simple. You actually uh, provide a reason why you deprecate it, uh, but uh, the method is still there and it still retains the, that, the data, so uh, it's really good for that person that compatibility. Uh, it has a lot of more features. Uh, sorry, my mouth is dry. One of them is uh, graphical. It's a graphical user interface to write queries. Uh, you'll see that in the demo. Uh, it also provides uh, documentation of, out of your uh, types, out of your data sheet. Uh, what's cool about GraphQL is that you can mix and match your uh, data. You can use uh, REST APIs, you can use uh, uh, databases, you can use any function. Your, your function can return the data or it can return the promise and your app will solve it for you. Uh, there's also mutations. Mutations uh, are like post in the uh, REST API world. Uh, you, change, you change something with it. And uh, it's a big part of GraphQL, but I think it's, uh, it deserves a separate talk because uh, since GraphQL is kind of a new kid on the block. Uh, <laughs> we don't really know yet uh, how to do it properly. Like REST API, we have a history of uh, good things and bad things, and we know now how to do things, but uh, with mutations, I think we're not quite there yet. Uh, it also has uh, typed inputs. I really like this part. Because if you type your input and you say, okay, I have to uh, provide some kind of an object which will have two fields and I give something else instead, it will shout at me, hey, there's an error, blah, blah, blah. Uh, some people don't agree with me and uh, they actually had a very bad time working with it, but uh, I love this part. Uh, there are some pain points. Uh, one of the pain points is denial of service tax. It's uh, not specific to GraphQL, uh, but you have to be extra care careful. Uh, yeah. Uh, second. Imagine a scenario where uh, you have 10 different, uh, your GraphQL uh, server is using under, uh, 10 different services under the hood. It's uh, calling them to get uh, to get its data. And you can write a query which will call all of them at once. So if the attacker is aware of such query, he can target 10 of your services at once. So uh, this is a bit of an issue. Uh, there are ways to handle this. Uh, we think that throttling is uh, one of them. Uh, if some someone Someone of you uh, is using it. Is anyone else using it, uh, using GraphQL here? Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you have better ideas, I, I I would like to hear them. What was the name of idea? How do you pronounce? Uh, How did you call it? Denial of service attacks, like. Uh, no, but how did you prevent? Throttling. Throttling. We do problem like uh, oh. for. Uh, user who is requesting uh, the data we would throttle. Uh, 
another another thing is uh, M plus one as well. Where it's, it's a very fancy name for something very simple. Uh, you can end up calling uh, when you need uh, some kind of data. You may end up with multiple multiple calls to get the same data, and uh, you will see in the demo how that happens. Uh, and uh, Facebook provides a library to prevent this. Uh, it uses combination of batching and uh, caching per request. Uh, Another issue is uh, cache. Uh, data loader will not help you here because data loader uh, caches things only per request. So if you do two separate requests to GraphQL, uh, it will do two separate requests to the underlying services. So uh, it's a bit difficult because, uh, for example, with REST API, you can simply <laughs> cache the endpoint and have some rules for specific endpoints. But with uh, GraphQL, you can do that for some kind of fields, but uh, I think it would be a hell to maintain. So it's kind of limited. So it's not possible to cache a concrete query. It is, but uh, what happens if you change your query? Or yeah, yeah, but I think uh, just for that kind of query, you cache on the yeah, but uh, it's hard to maintain because you can have a lot of entities and you will see uh, in the demo what kind of uh, queries you can write, so it's mind boggling. Uh, there are ways to uh, to handle cache uh, and uh, that's where Relay comes in. I'm not really sure how it works, but it has some kind of uh, fancy features like refetch and uh, fancy caching mechanism. but. Uh, that's all I can say about it. Uh, another issue is ownership. It's uh, very specific to middleware servers. Imagine that uh, if you have uh, 10 microservices which don't know anything about each other and they don't want to know anything about each other and you have to do some logic which incorporates them and uh, yeah, so the bad code ends up in your uh, Nowhere server in the GraphQL server where you combine both uh, both of the services, so uh, you have to fight this really hard. Another issue is monitoring. Uh, this might be very specific to us um, because, for example, we do have a node framework for uh, re uh, regular REST APIs, and uh, with the framework we have like built-in uh, neural network uh, monitoring. But uh, with GraphQL, it's a bit different because uh, New Relic uh, kind of monitors by endpoint, and uh, with GraphQL, you kind of have only one endpoint in different ways. So uh, it's kind of an issue, and you have to have some uh, custom uh, transactions, and you have to do do this manually. It's kind of a do it yourself kind of thing. So that's that's why it's a pain point. And uh, yeah. We will do a live example. Uh, we will use Star Wars API. I think that most of you already know what it is, if you don't. Uh, we will use only uh, two endpoints. We will use the film endpoint, which uh, will return title, episode ID, release characters, a lot of uh, more uh, fields, and uh, characters. Characters are references to people. And as you can see on the right, people have name, mass, uh, hair color, blah, blah, blah. And uh, films field, which are uh, references back to the films. So what we will try to do is we will try to show actual entities instead of references to them. So uh, let's start coding. I'll try to do this quick, and uh, <laughs> if I'm a bit too fast, uh, feel free to slow me down. Uh, we'll have only one file, uh, and I have all the modules. Uh, there are not a lot of them. Uh, can you see all right? Uh, sorry, what? Still not. <laughs> More? Okay, just give me a 
سعيد بتا اوكي for the demo we'll use only uh, five modules uh, we'll use express i think most of you already know what express is it's uh, kind of our server uh, we will use express express graphql which is middleware for express server uh, express middleware for graphql <laughs> uh, we will use the graphql itself we will use fetch to fetch the data from star wars api and we will use the data loader and you will see why <laughs> okay uh, i'm not typing everything because i would end up with a lot of errors uh, so if, if uh if i forget something uh, if i forget to explain something feel free to stop me and ask uh, okay so we will use four things uh, from the graphical itself uh, by the way, I'm using ES6 uh, deconstructors. I hope you already know what it is. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so we will use list uh, and string types. Those are basically types. We will use object type to build our own types. And we will use the schema which we will pass to our express middleware. Okay. This is how we initiate our app. We, uh, we initiate Express. We try to uh, use uh, ex uh, GraphQL middleware under GraphQL endpoint. So whenever we open up localhost uh, slash GraphQL, we will see this. Our, our application will, will run on port 3000. Uh, yeah, uh, for the uh, graphical middleware, we have to pass the schema, which we don't have yet. And uh, we set a graphical true, uh, which will show us the graphical tool once we open that uh, graphical endpoint. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to define our query type. Okay, query type is built with a graphical object type. It has a name and it has fields. So beginning uh, actually for all the demo we will have only one field only the films uh, films by themselves will return a list of film types which we don't have yet but uh, we'll do in a second uh, it will accept one argument which is uh, IDs and uh, those IDs will be uh, a list of strings uh, this is the result function which uh, resolves the data for for the actual uh, for the actual type, and uh, it has uh, two arguments. Uh, first argument is the the query itself. Second argument is uh, it, oh, is uh, these arguments. And uh, what we do here is uh, for each of the ID, we call get and we provide the Star Wars API uh, URL. And uh, yeah, we, we simply get it from, from that URL. Uh, we don't have the get function yet, so let's define it. The get function is basically a wrapper for uh, fetch. It consoles the URL that we're calling, uh, and you will see why. Uh, we actually fetched the actual URL, and uh, we added form edges on this very specific to Star Wars API, so you can just discard that. And uh, what we do here is we return the actual JSON instead of uh, resolving promise twice as you have to with fetch. So okay, what we are missing here is the film type. So let's add the film type. Uh, the film type is built the same way as the query type. It has a name and it has fields. For now, it has only one field, uh, which is a string. So let's add more. Uh, now, it, will, uh, it has producer, release date, uh, and all others which are 
are strings. And the last one, we have characters. For now, let's leave them as they are, uh, a list of strings. And uh, I want to uh, see it working. So let's start our server. I think it's OK. It should work. Okay, so let's write our first query. Uh, here uh, we will write heal, which is in our query type. And as you remember, it has one argument, which is IDs. And we have to pass an array of IDs to it. And what we want to get is the title of the thing. Look, look how cool is this. Uh, we get the auto complete and the Docs, which are a lot of stuff. And this is really helpful, by the way, in the beginning when people start with GraphQL and they're not quite sure yet how it works. Uh, so, yeah, so use GraphQL if you uh, if, if if you will try if you will try this. Um, okay, so let's try. Okay, so we have the title, we have the episode ID, and we have the chart. <coughs> what we want to do now is we want to show the actual character entities instead of uh, instead of a list of URLs. So, give me a second. Excuse me. Can you zoom in more? More? Yes. Okay here? Yeah? And here? Better? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so what what we will start with uh, changing the characters view. Uh, let's see how it changed. Uh, now instead of uh, having a list of strings. We will have a list of character types, and uh, we have to pro provide a resolve function, and we do that by calling get function for each of the character URLs. Like, uh, uh, then it okay, will be on the one request, yeah? No, not really. <laughs> not yet. You will see. We actually cannot do. Uh, one request because that's the way how Star Wars API work. You have to provide IDs and uh, you cannot like post and uh, send a batch of IDs to get that. Mm. It's so. just one request from client side. So ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so one request. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> from the server perspective, it's doing a lot of requests, but for the client perspective, for example, the app, if you would uh, call. Uh, this endpoint, and you would call for the, for the characters. Uh, you would you would get everything in one request, but the underlying GraphQL server would do a lot of requests to get the data. Okay, so the resolve function has uh, has the first argument film, which is the film itself, uh, and uh, the film itself has characters. As you remember, it was an array of URLs. So for each of the URL in the array, we call the get function. Okay, so now <coughs> we need to uh, define our character type. I don't remember the snippet. Sorry about that. Okay, okay so we have the character type. Character type is very similar to, to film type. It has a name, it has fields, and the fields that represent the fields from the Star Wars API endpoint. Uh, we have four fields, all of them are strings, and uh, we will add the most complex one, which is... Uh, oh crap. Which is uh, a film type. And uh, the 
way it works is really the same as it was in the film time. Do you have any questions uh, about this? Okay, that you have two characters in the film time. And the film time you define character part. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thanks. Oh. I would see the error here, but thanks. <laughs> Okay, so I think, yeah, it's working. So we can try this out. And as you can see, since we changed the character type and it's no longer uh, array strings, uh, it's a full, full entity. It now says that uh, you have to have some kind of sub-selection of uh, subfield. So that's what we will do. We will ask for the names of the characters. Okay, so that's how we get all of the names. We can ask for more stuff. And let's ask for the films. Because uh, all the characters are in some kind of a film. So, and let's wait for it. <laughs> because uh, that's what data loader is for. As you can see, we're doing a lot of requests to the same endpoints. We're doing, uh, yeah, we basically have only seven uh, Star Wars films, and we're calling uh, those endpoints over and over again. So we will try to fix that with that loader. Uh, we will start with uh, film type. So let's see how it changed. Our resolve function now has uh, three arguments. Uh, there's first one didn't change. Uh, the second one is irrelevant because we don't really have arguments for this field. And the third one is context. Context we don't have yet, uh, but for uh, graphical middleware, uh, we can provide a context, and uh, that's what we will do. We will. Uh, we will provide context, and uh, in the context, we will have Charboy URL loader, which is an instance of URL. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, which is an instance of uh, data loader object. And uh, data loader itself has only two methods. One method is load, where you pass only one ID, and the other method is uh, load many. Uh, you can have multiple places in your code where you call the same data loader and you call uh, load menu, you call load, and in the end what it does, it combines all of those IDs uh, and uh, you have to resolve them. And you will see in the second half. Uh, let's do the same for uh, character type. We're doing actually the same thing, uh, except that we will use film, film by URL loader Different uh, different data for it. Okay. So what we need to do now is we need to provide the context. So uh, yeah, we we pass the char by URL loader and film by URL loader here, which we don't have yet. Uh, so let's fix that. So this is how our data loader looks like. It's uh, an instance data loader and uh, it accepts a function as an argument. That function uh, has to return a promise and uh, that function's argument is the array of all batched IDs. In this case, we're not really using IDs, we're using uh, the actual URLs as you saw in the slide here. It's, uh, oh, sorry. It's like uh, swapy.go API people want. Uh, yeah, let's define chart by URL loader. Okay, I think we're good to go. Okay, that happens, but uh, it's very specific to 
graphical. I'm not sure yet why it happens. Maybe because the uh, the the service is uh, responding every time because I have node mod here, node mod card. If you if you know what it is. So okay, we did the same uh, we did the same request, and, and, and as you can see, what did that happen? Okay, <laughs> let's start from the beginning. See, we are no longer in, we are no longer making uh, calls to the same uh, endpoints. Uh, basically, yeah, we are not doing multiple calls to the same endpoints except for the first one, the first ones. You know why? Did anyone notice why? It's not using, it's yes. Good job. Okay, so let's change that. This will be the most complex uh, data loader. So if I fail to explain this properly, I'll just fail. <laughs> okay, so what changed? Uh, we have the context as, uh, with other data loaders and uh, we will need to introduce uh, the film loader, which we don't have yet. And we will have to call uh, load menu for all of the arguments for all the IDs. Okay, so let's let's delete this and let's try to define our loader. Okay. Uh, first, I have to add it here. Added to the context as you uh, saw that uh, what I did with char and film by URL uh, and what I'm doing now is I'm defining the film mode. How does it look? That's actually uh, data loaders are uh, a bit of a pain point by uh, by itself because. Uh, <coughs> Downloader is a very small and very simple library. It's, I think it's only 270 lines of code, but uh, you can have a lot of pain dealing with this because uh, you don't really understand what, what is this promise all and why, why am I calling all of these different things. It's, uh, it's, it was my first reaction when I saw this. So okay, I'll try to explain this. The first, uh, the first argument is uh, the same as in other loaders. It's a, it's a function which returns a promise. Now, what we do here, what we do here is uh, uh, we call a get function for each of the IDs we have, and we combine all of them to one promise, to promise all, and how that's how they are resolved. Now. Uh, we're using a different uh, ID, like uh, in, the, in the query, we only provide one and two, but uh, with other, uh, for example, with film by URL loader, we have not the ID, but the actual URL for the film. So what we need to do is we need to uh, use same cache map for both loaders, and uh, we need to know that one is actually the same as, uh, as a full URL. So that's why we use cache key function. And we say that for each key, uh, treat it like it's this string. And uh, yeah, and uh, we provide the, the cache map. We also need to provide the cache map for full by URL loader. So let's do that. I think that we are ready to go. Still takes time. Oopsie baby. Okay, but we are no longer calling the same from the sandbox. So 
that's where I stop. <laughs> you have any questions? What happens if like so two requests fail? It fails. <laughs> you don't get a data then? Yes. You don't get so, data. so if you have maybe that connection you're going to have if you're using the phone. But uh, uh, take note that uh, when you are uh, connecting to GraphQL server from your app, you're only connecting to GraphQL mm -hmm. and uh, Grab. GraphQL it, does the job, right? Yeah, GraphQL does the job. And uh, for example, if you're using in-house services, that's usually pretty fast, like a few milliseconds. So you don't really care. What else you do uh, is you don't really have uh, fun, uh, like methods where you uh, ask for one entity. You would you would simply have methods where you provide an array of IDs and you would say, okay, get me films uh, with these IDs, and it would provide the array of, of, of those films. So in that way, you would actually do one call. With, to the underlying server. So you can optimize, but if you don't have an option, you can do this. Yeah, but that was the question, you know, one, if one of the microservices fails. Yes, so it do, fails. Do you provide like partial data or you fail the whole question? Oh, no, you, you provide the partial data. Is it handle, yeah. handleable somehow? Yeah, you can have different uh, approaches to this. Actually, you might, I think you might end up uh, having uh, failed requests like uh, 500s. But uh, for example, if you have a try catch for uh, some of your fields, you can always uh, catch and return something like uh, empty array. So uh, it's really up to you how, how you handle this. And how do you handle the problems? Uh, <laughs> different ways. Did you open that with this problem? No, not really. We had a lot of different problems. For example, with uh, data loaders, that's why it's a pain point. Uh, me and my colleague uh, were dealing with two different data loaders to get very similar data. Actually, underlying services were doing the, the same uh, thing. One was for chat, the other was for, for uh, other thing. And, uh, what happened is that the other colleague managed to write a data loader in a way that once uh, you call a service, uh, you get some kind of data and you cache it forever. Like, it's there until you restart the server. Uh, and me, on the other hand, uh, I managed to do it in a way that it would call uh, a very good method where you where you can pass an array of IDs, uh, I would call it a hundred times with an array of one ID. <laughs> that happened, but uh, it's okay. We managed. Uh, as you said, it, in this way, it would cache it forever, right? I don't think it so. Cache it, for, uh, it, ca it caches per request, I think. So for a start. Yeah, you are right. I messed up. <laughs> no, not really. Uh, that's actually <clears throat> that's actually uh, why we did the mistake. Uh, uh, when we were writing those data loaders, we actually had to pass uh, more uh, more arguments to the underlying services, and the <coughs> data loaders are really limited because you have only one. Uh, argument for it. So you have to think of a way how to pass other arguments to it. So what we did is we had a function which returns the data loader and uh, we we have to cache the data loader somewhere and uh, we're doing it uh, per request context and uh, the other guy managed to uh, Put the cache not in the request context, not not in the function, but in, in in the file, so it was cached forever. And me, on the other hand, I managed to return a, a new data loader for each of the loads. So. Yeah. The question is, how do you ensure consistency between uh, front end and back end for the schema? If you are 
in producing fields, for example, which are required, how do you go about that? What do you mean? Uh, I mean, if you have a function and you have required arguments for that in uh, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. how do you proceed with that? Uh, you make it optional, first of all, and afterwards you like enforce it required, or? It really depends. How Since do you think this thing? Since we have to treat backwards compatibility, so one way would be to simply have another uh, field in the in the query type, in the root of the queries, uh, with a different name where you have a different set of arguments, but it would return the same type. You understand what I mean? Yeah. 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 So that's one way to handle this, and. Uh, the other, yeah, you could uh, always make uh, things optional and uh, decide for yourself how you will handle this. And uh, I'm not sure which one is the best way because it really depends on uh, on the context. Does that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> okay. <coughs> uh, I see. Like uh, there is a lot of complexity involved in setting up server and communicating with clients and microservices where do you think lies the bound between like is it worth to go the graphql path or to stick with rest good question i don't know like uh, if you were to make a wrap uh, once again would you uh, still choose graphql yes why because uh, all of the reasons I told you before. <laughs> yeah, but like in, in the beginning, most of the things I heard, we failed, failed at this and that and that, no? Well, we didn't fail those. Well, it had difficulties with. Yes, but uh, you have difficulties everywhere, basically. Yeah, but once you started, uh, did the difficulties went away? Some of them, yes. Yeah. Would you say that you have more problems with GraphQL than the rest? In your experience? My colleagues would say that, I suppose. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I was kind of very pro GraphQL, and uh, some of the people in the, in the team weren't. And actually, like, after using uh, it for a few months, uh, the, the opinion was the same. The, the people who were skeptic about it still remain skeptic. and. Uh, the ones who were pro GraphQL are still pro GraphQL. So uh, it really depends why, <coughs> what you will use it for. Like if uh, if your uh, reasoning is uh, you want to have less network requests, you want to have, uh, for example, you are forced to have the middleware server which will connect underlying services uh, either way. So why not? Like, uh, it's, this thing was built for uh, this purpose, so yes, but uh, if you want to use it just because it's uh, a cool new thing, so probably not, it's, uh, why? Well, you could say that uh, I would want the functionality to offer us, but still, uh, it's, it, like there is a lot of technology involved and lots of risks with the, Places where it break, so like, uh, does it break a lot or is it stable? Well, it's stable. It's stable enough, I would say. Uh, the problem is, uh, as I said, monitoring. That's what uh, one of our current problems. Uh, but uh, regarding the availability of it, it's. I, I would say it's stable. Scale it to three nodes, four nodes. Is it worth it? Do you need it? Uh, or it's so like Well, we for now we only use two nodes, uh, two servers, and uh, but we don't have that many users yet. We are just starting to. Uh, and, I mean, do you do, do these nodes know about each other? I mean, are you using no. load balancing as a system? Yeah, load balancing. That's it. Uh, Netflix uh, has similar to Qualcomm, no? Uh, yeah, you can... Sorry. Okay. 
name, which is Maybe you heard about the Apollo project. I did. They use GraphQL, right? Yeah, I think so, but they, I think they provide some kind of a tool which is a alternative to Relay, and I'm not yet sure what is Relay, because we don't use it, so uh, that's all I know. But uh, this Apollo project is like for real gamification. Yeah, okay. Uh, I Maybe I missed I something. <laughs> No, no, can't tell you, can't tell you that. Can you, can you get, can you use GraphQL without Relay? For example, if I were building yes. some application, like yes. Relay would be very heavy and would, uh, performance would downgrade. That's actually why we don't use Relay, because, well, we started, more, okay, now it's more than three months ago, but uh, when we started, we were really new to uh, React Native, and we were really new to GraphQL. So uh, we decided that that's enough for our new stack. And uh, we didn't use Relay. And uh, it turned out fine. Uh, and how do you query it? Do you like uh, write, write the query in the string? Yeah. Do you use the client, GraphQL client, and paste it in the string link yeah. afterwards? No, not really. We actually use fetch. And uh, we. We build the query as uh, you can actually write very fancy queries. Uh, let me try. For example, uh, this is anonymous function, so let's call it get films, and we can provide variables, which will be okay. Let's call it. Uh, ID and it will be a string. No, I'm not sure. Maybe it's. Oh, I never used. Okay. Uh, so what we will do here? Do you understand what's happening here? Uh, we are uh, get passing an argument to function. I'm uh, I'm passing a variable to it, and uh, the variable has to be. Of uh, type string, yeah, and the uh, exclamation point means that it's required. So what we do here is <coughs> pass the actual ID variable. Let's call it one, which has to be a string. Sorry. And uh, that's that's how we write queries. We write the string, and. Uh, Okay, how you write the uh, the query in the, for example, for the fetch function, it would look like this. For example, it would be the query, which is the, the, the query itself, and uh, let's say it's query, uh, let's get films. Oh my god! Just... <clears throat> in a second. I would pass variables Actually, could have could have done this. So sorry about that. <laughs> I needed needed the elevator music. Do you have any more questions? Is that it? Oh yeah, regarding consistency. Yeah, sorry. Uh, do you have like any tests running contract obligation tests uh, towards back end and front end from schema? Uh, if you see that you know you're changing the schema, uh, nothing breaks. Uh, no, we're not validating the schema, not yet. 
we're thinking how to fix this issue, but uh, no, not yet. We don't have. That's it. Thank you.